In this episode of STEMiverse, Marcus and I talk with Keith Hergert. Keith is an academic at the University of Technology Sydney and the University of Western Sydney. He's an organiser at the New South Wales Independent Education Union, expecting a PhD in Citizen Education and Critical Pedagogy, expected at the end of 2017, and many more qualifications in education and engineering. In this conversation, Keith discusses some of the STEM-related topics that excite him, including community-led makerspaces, the magic of the Raspberry Pi, programming, online resources for teachers, and practical approaches to teaching science. This is STEMiverse, Episode 5. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dalmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. Hi, Keith. Thank you very much for joining us in this episode of STEMiverse. Really appreciate it. Uh, we are looking forward to having a chat with you and um, share with our audience your experiences as uh, somebody who, from what Marcus tells me and what I've read myself, you've got um, quite an, uh, like a, a track record in as a teacher and also creating content, educational content and writing articles uh, in relation to STEM and teaching. So, uh, yeah, so, so I'm good at lots of different things. Or maybe not so good, but I've got my fingers in lots of different pies. <laughs> L- let's explore that. Would you like to take uh, a few minutes and introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you and your relation to teaching and uh, perhaps what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, and, and thank you for, for having me on the, the podcast. I, I was thrilled to be, to be asked. So my name's Keith Haggart. Um, I'm a former high school teacher. Um, currently working as a, a casual academic for the University of Technology, Sydney, um, in, in education. And I'm also an organiser for the Independent Education Union. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I've got a, a broad experience. I'm also a, an Apple Distinguished Educator. Um, I was a Google Certified Teacher, but now they're calling them Google Innovators. Um, I'm a fellow for the Royal Society for the Arts as well, um, and a member of the Royal Society for New South Wales, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm one of these people who loves getting certificates and letters after their name. But I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I was always that person. If there's there's a button to push, I wanted to be the one to push it and find out what it did. So that, that's kind of what I what I'm interested in. That's uh, quite amazing. Um, do you ever sleep, Keith? Uh, not often. <laughs> no, I'm I'm very lucky to have a very supportive family who who help me out with all kinds of things. So yeah, a shout out to my wife. <laughs> um, in particular, at the moment, I, I guess I've got a little bit of space now that I'm not not you know like every other teacher out there working fifty hours a week. I'm really interested in this idea of um, community led and funded maker spaces. So you, you might remember about ten years ago there was this huge boom in in men's sheds and things like that. Certainly, in and and this is another bit of a, an interest of mine. Certainly in regional and rural and and areas away from the the metropolitan centres, there is a need and, and an opportunity to develop um, these kind of community or fractionally owned or democratically run, however you want to describe them, maker spaces that, that provide services mostly to, to, to young people. And, and, you know, let's have a pretty broad definition of young, you know, I'm talking about anyone under 30. Um, but to set up something that's a, a bit of a self-sustaining maker space I'm not particularly interested in, in the Penrith and the, you know, the, certainly the, the greater western area of Sydney because while there are maker spaces available and, and some of them are absolutely fantastic in Sydney, um, there, there's not many available in western Sydney uh, that, that aren't attached or, or costly to use. You know, and I, I think you could run classes and events and, and you could introduce people of all ages and all skill levels to STEM education and fiddling, as I like to call it, in a, in a fun and a non-threatening way. So, so I guess you know if you if you've got money to invest or you you run a social entrepreneurship business or something like that, and you want to get in touch, you don't hesitate. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a bit of a plug for what I'm doing at the moment. But yeah, oh, all for it, Keith. 
So what does a maker space need besides people? I think I think the key is to start off small. Um, you know, and, and the name Makerspace is new, but the the concepts behind it aren't necessarily new. You know, I was a I was a high school teacher. You know, funnily enough, I taught English and history, not nothing to do with, with computers or technology, though I kind of moved into that that area. Um and, and there were always those teachers in the in the schools who who were, were, you know, people who provided space for students to, to go and experiment and explore and, and say, what happens if I do this? And, and generally it's teachers giving up their, their time and their goodwill. So, you know, that kind of willingness is, is a central thing to, to making any kind of community venture successful. And then, I mean, you know, the other thing that really makes this hugely exciting is, is the low cost for entry. I mean, when you can go out and buy a, a Raspberry Pi starter kit, you know, for for about a hundred bucks, I think that's just extraordinary. You know, I, I remember the old days when a, a laptop used to set you back about five or six thousand dollars, and and now you know you get something that's even more powerful and it's the size of a credit card, and and you know you can, can connect whatever you like to it. You know, <laughs> I just and and when it breaks and you know because you will break it and delete things that you shouldn't delete, you just you know. Reflash the SD card and, and start all over again. I just think that's huge. I think that that's what revolution looks like, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm more of a knowledge kind of revolution than um, burning <laughs> yeah. the place down with more lot of. So I just saw an interesting, th- uh, an interesting uh, meme on Facebook the other day about this same topic and how lucky we are to have these opportunities today, especially kids. Have you got an example uh, of such? Make a space that is perhaps operating in Sydney right now, and can you, if there is such a place, can you tell us uh, how it's doing and uh, what the experience of people attending, or especially kids attending, is like? Well, I've seen them work in schools really, really well, um, and and yeah, especially uh, now. Now I am going to do a bit of a plug. Um, and I have no association with this organisation. <laughs> um, but there are schools in, in um, uh, the Catholic systemic schools in Parramatta who, who are quite some extraordinary stuff. Yeah, and there's, there's some incredible teachers out there. Um, maybe they'd be really good guests on your podcast for another episode um, who, who have set up what I would call fantastic makerspaces in their schools um, where, where children have the opportunity to, to learn you know, everything from the basics of, of Python programming and HTML all the way up to, you know, quite sophisticated fabrication techniques with 3D printers and CNC machines and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and schools generally, some schools have the resources to do that. Um, yeah, but, the, you know, the, the point that I, I guess I was just trying to make, and I'll just touch on it again, is that not all schools have those resources and, and not all children have access to those resources in the school. So, uh, you know, and I think there has to be a, a community um, a community opportunity there as well. Uh, in, in those uh, cases in, in the Catholic system, uh, are those makerspaces available to the community or specifically designed for the students of the school? Just for the students, yeah. We should perhaps uh, design and make available makerspaces that are available and open to the community. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, if we're, we're going to go down this path and say that children need to learn about STEM education, um, and and that's an interesting conversation, and then you know we will probably get onto that later on. Um, but if we, if we are going to go down that path and we're going to put it in the curriculum, well, you know, surely we've got to provide everybody in schools and and maybe outside of schools, um, because let's not forget that learning doesn't just happen in schools. You learn more outside of of schools than you ever do in schools, and I say that as a teacher. <laughs> Um, and, and it's got to be a, a chance for everyone to, to have a bit of fun with it, you know. So how should a teacher get the skills that they need to be able to run a makerspace? Yeah, I, th- I think I'm actually a, a pretty good um, example of that. Uh, you know, I was trained as, a, as an English and a, and a history teacher, um, and I've always been, you know, interested in, in computers and, and games and, and technology and, and, you know, mobile phones and things like that. But I think... It doesn't matter whether you're you're a teacher who has no experience 
or whether you're a student coming into or, you know, a young person coming into a, a makerspace or a classroom or something like that for the first time, the, the central thing has got to be experiment and try and have a bit of fun and, and take away, you know, this, this pressure that is unfortunately all too present in schools, this, this you know, you have to assess everything. And, and let's put a little bit more fun back into this, you know, and, and, and let's not be afraid to, to try and, and do different things. I mean, there is such – you want to talk about revolution. There is such a profusion of free and accessible resources out there to teachers, um, you know, from, from websites like Edutopia, which is just a fantastic general, um, general purpose resource. Um, right down to really quite structured kind of teaching and learning activities. I mean, uh, Instructables is always good because they, they and they've actually stepped up their game a little bit because there's now um, classes based on on maker spacery kind of things. Uh, another one that I'm a really big fan on fan of is Treehouse, um, which which you might have heard of. They they generally uh, charge a little bit for for a monthly thing, but the, the quality of their their materials is is quite high, um, yeah, and I think there's a range of, of you know free downloadable books. So if you were starting a maker space today, what would be the first thing you buy? Um, raspberry Pis. I, I find, I find yeah, it's hard to go past a, the Raspberry Pi for a, a multi-purpose kind of um, computing device, you know, and and. The, the Raspberry Pi Foundation knew exactly what they were doing because the the kind of tools, the, the kind of the kind of projects that you can create are just so diverse. I mean, you know, you can start off and you can do really quite basic um, developing, you know, programs via Scratch or or you know in the the Python um, uh, development environment, and that's all in the software side of things. Um, but equally, you know, if you want to use the the in app pins. And you can set up yourself up your your own little security camera, and and trust me when I say this, I've never seen a year eight boy who is not deeply fascinated by the idea of being able to set up a motion detecting security camera, you know, and and, and it's it's relatively straightforward, and it's fun. I, I see kids uh, becoming so excited about a blinking LED, <laughs> let alone all these more advanced, amazing things, especially once you get into robotics and things of that sort. But uh, one question that I often have is all the uh, makerspaces that I've seen are heavily biased, I think biased is perhaps the right word, towards engineering and computer science. So you look at the Raspberry Pi, for example, it's, it's a really good platform for learning both. But when we are teaching STEM, we often forget about the, the first few letters, like the, especially the science letter and the mathematics. How, in your experience, how can we also expose children to science and mathematics? And of course, later, art, but let's talk about science and mathematics first through these technologies. Yeah, I mean, the argument in, in schools, and it's incredibly simplistic, and it drives me, me up the wall, and my wife's a science teacher, and it drives her up the wall as well, is that, oh, you know, how can we get kids interested in science and technology? And I think that's just the, the wrong line of argument. You know, there is not a child out there who isn't deeply curious about dinosaurs and space and all of that kind of stuff. The, the challenge is to maintain that curiosity through formal education, um, which can be really difficult and ultimately comes down to the influence of parents and the influence of the teacher, um, and then make it much more than just curious, because curious is, is shallow and often quite short-lived, and then you move on to and do something else. You know, it's that, that toad of toad hall, you know, I'm interested in this. No, now I'm interested in this. No, now I'm interested in this. Um, and, and yeah, to, to make it, uh, to study it, to, you know, to study science, to study mathematics, um, you know, you know, it needs to be more than just curiosity. It needs to be almost a, a deep and abiding interest and passion in why things happen the way they do. Um, but I think the tools are there, and I've certainly seen it done well. Um, I, I have a colleague who has used the Raspberry Pi to set up their own um, telescope. It's called the the PiCon. 
Yeah. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it, yeah. Design. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, there you go, buddy. There's science right there for you. You know, taking photos of the moon and everything. I mean, and, and you know, you can go so much further. You know, I used to teach a bit of geography, and the part that I used to hate the most was, you know, the, the weather charts and things like that because it just felt so removed from children's experiences. But you use a pie or something similar to set up your own um, weather station and then, yeah, you play around with it and you make sure all the kids get emails as soon as the weather goes over 35 degrees or something and, and you'll have kids lining up around the block to get into your classroom. And then, you know, the maths comes in. Uh, you know, what, what we – and I say this as a non-maths teacher, but I've taught maths. Um, what is often happening in classrooms and, – and I think this is probably changing a little bit and it's a good thing um, – is that we teach computation, we teach calculation, we don't necessarily teach mathematical thinking. Um, and, and, you know, teachers can only do what they can um, within the constraints of the curriculum. But I think taking real-world kind of issues and problems, and kids aren't necessarily going to solve climate change or anything like that. They can engage with things that are affecting them in, in you know, their lived experience, you know. It was really hot today. Is it always this hot this year? You know, and so that, that certainly from a statistical point of view, um, the, the mathematics is there straight away. And I mean, you, know, you, you teach kids to program. You teach them abstract concepts like object-oriented programming and functions and that kind of stuff. And and that will stand them in good stead once mathematics gets a little bit more complicated than you know multiplying two-digit numbers and things like that. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, uh, I think what happens with kids is the most important responsibility that we have as teachers is to not kill their creativity in the early years of school. And that will eventually naturally lead them to more discoveries in all those other areas, uh, especially in science and mathematics. Uh, is, that, is that your experience in a nutshell? Yeah, yeah. I mean, teachers work within a framework that they, they can do, you know, and, and, and often uh, a lot of the decisions that I would consider that, that ruin the experience of, children, of, of education for some people are beyond their control. But I'm a big fan of letting, you know, let teachers be teachers and, and get out of the way. So many teachers are passionate and determined and, and they are good at what they do if you, let, if, you, if you trust them as professionals to do their job. What do you find is restricting them from doing that? The, the requirements that are placed upon teachers in terms of administrative tasks are just ridiculous. Um, you know, the, the fact that teachers spend more time dealing with, with the paperwork, even though it's electronic, but it's, it's paperwork, uh, than they do planning for their lessons or assessing lessons or anything like that, I think it just sucks the, the will of and the, the, the joy out of teaching for many teachers. Um, the, the demands for constant meetings. You know, <laughs> I have this conversation with people who, who don't seem to understand that teachers spend at least 25 hours every week in front of children and, and everything else that they're required to do comes on top of that. Um, you know, so, so that needs to be minimised to allow them to do the, the, the teaching part of things as, as as well as they possibly can, you know. So the the other thing, standardised testing is no one's friend. Uh, I think there's a, a place to play for for diagnostic testing, uh, but you know, if you're in if you're a primary school teacher, for example, you know, in year three, you've probably got NAPLAN, which means there'll be practice NAPLAN, and then there'll probably be a, a reading test, like a PAD R or a PAD M, a maths test. Uh, all kinds of other things. And then you've got your, all your other school-based assessments for all the other subjects. I mean, you know, when do you stop assessing and actually start doing some teaching and some learning? <laughs> yeah, so, all right, I'm off my, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> well, to continue that thought, <laughs> I was just thinking that uh, looking at the top end of uh, education, like uh, universities such as MIT, what they started doing lately is to also look at potential students' portfolio 
of things that they have done other than just raw marks from various tests. So if you want to go into, say, the Media Lab, for example, at MIT, you need to show that you actually build interesting gadgets, programmed systems, or have done um, you know, even art projects that are relevant to what the school uh, is set up to do instead of just looking at uh, what your undergraduate scores have been. So I think uh, they, they are leading the change towards um, a different way of assessing people other than just raw numbers. And speaking of which, <laughs> what's your take on the change that has happened in, in terms of how students learn uh, or the demands that uh, are placed on the schooling system uh, over the last 10 or 20 years? So how have things changed, let's say, 20 years ago? Yeah, that, that, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think, I think it, uh, well, learning itself hasn't changed. As a, as a neurophysiological or a neurobiological process, learning, learning you know, hasn't really changed. We, we are learning more about learning, if you want to get all meta about it, um, and we're, we're beginning to understand more about learning um, and, and how that might shape education. But I think that's a really new kind of field. And, and um, teachers, teachers, in my experience, work from, from reflective practice, practice, you know, what they've discovered. I, I don't think it's changed. education has changed enough. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think what has changed has changed in the right direction. Um, you know, so what I what really worries me is that we are, are beginning to, and I'm going to talk about education as a bit of a, a structure here, but the, the, this perception that we're moving away from education as this public good, good as this community um, involved operation towards this really quite consumerist understanding of education where people feel like, you know, I pay this much, I should be guaranteed this kind of result for my 17-year-old. And, you know, we're beginning to see court cases where where schools are being taken to court because, you know, student A did not get the grades that they, they felt that they should have, and it's down to the school. And I think education is, is, is far more complex than that. One of my, one of my u- university lecturers um, said, you know, I- I'm going to teach this to you, but I can't learn it for you. You know, so, th- so that speaks to this, this two-way, um, oh, it's more than two-way if you involve communities and parents and, and other family members. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's a nexus of, of different people involved in education to make it, to make it successful, and and that needs to be maintained. Um, and and I'm I'm worried that it's gradually slipping away. Having said that, you know there, there is hope out there because there's all these really exciting alternatives to education. I mean, you know, let, let me tell you my big big idea. Another big idea of how education could be, you know, revolutionised because hey, we're throwing revolutionised around a lot. So. Let, let's take your, your average year nine maths class, okay? Um, and according to, uh, I think it was ASA, um, one of the, the researchers there, uh, they reckon that there could be up to seven years of difference between the classes. So they're, they're all meant to be 14 or 15-year-olds, but some of them might be working at the, you know, 17-year-olds and some of them might be working at 10-year-old standards. And tr- teachers have traditionally really struggled with differentiation, um, and, and finding a way to meet the needs, and, and the students are entitled to have their needs met, uh, of all of those students in, in one class. And, and that's where, you know, streaming fits in. But even with things like streaming and setting, there's still a huge variation amongst the abilities of, of students. Um, but here's the thing, you know, there, there might be 30 kids in that Year 9 maths class, but there's probably, oh, let's say, 70,000 year nine students across the state of New South Wales. Of those 70,000, you know, a whole bunch, I'm talking thousands, will be at about the same level. And there'll be another couple of thousand that'll be at the same level. So if we think bigger about education, and, and you know, this is where I think the the mathematics side of things or the, the MOOCs side of things might be able to fit in, um, you know, we, we should be able to, by thinking bigger about education, more carefully um, 
or, or more successfully personalise education. Now, there's still a role for the teacher in there, but I also think it needs to be a mediated role between the teacher, uh, the access to this material, probably via technological means, and then the role of the student in um, using that material. Yeah, so, so to, to phrase that, it seems that you're suggesting your revolutionary thought is that students perhaps should not be divided into aged based groups, but perhaps other criteria, perhaps uh, capability or understanding of a particular topic, uh, desire to learn a particular topic, that would be one. But the other one would be to use computers as teachers a lot more than we do today, because through computers, we can actually customize the learning experience of a student to their exact requirements. Mass customization of Mass, the product. Yeah, that's where the online courses come into play. And then, of course, the, the teacher's role remains, but becomes, I suppose, more uh, organizational, mentoring perhaps. Uh, in such a future, I can imagine where children are, are, are grouped together based on some other criteria other than age, and then uh, much uh, more uh, deep use of computers and online courses for customized learning. How do you see the teacher fitting in in such an environment? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when, when I was growing up, I used to have these um, Beyond 2000 books and, and we were all going to be living on the moon. <laughs> and, and one of the, the jobs that wasn't going to exist anymore was, was teaching. And, and, you know, here we are in 2017 and, and you know what? We need teachers more than ever. But I, th I think I think teachers will, um, I, th I think there's an opportunity, and, and this is this could be really quite exciting for some teachers, but there's an opportunity for specialisation, um, you know, in, in a way that some teachers could possibly um, become more focused on, on developing the content and, and really, you know, using uh, machine learning and, and that kind of thing to help develop uh, content flows, I guess that's that's one way of putting it, that, you know, whatever level a child is at, the next um, the next task that they do is in the that, that zone of proximal development that allows them to, you know, make that leap without being too too scared to make that leap. Whereas other teachers I think could possibly specialize into this a more generalist relationship field. I mean, any teacher will tell you that teaching is all about the relationships that you have. Um, and, and it almost becomes, you know, I think, I think Michael Fullan calls it the guide on the side rather than the, the sage on the stage. Um, you know, and, and that, that, that's an interesting metaphor for, you know, almost a, a careers advisor. But it would need to be more than just careers because, you know, teaching has to be – or education has to be about more than just getting a job after 12 years. So it's not really about – so teachers in the future, actually – perhaps in, in the present as well in, in a large extent, but in the future, once computers take over teaching, teachers will not be there to distribute facts like they do a lot of that today, right? They will be playing more of a, of a mentorship, uh, like I suppose a surrogate parent type of role to take care of kids instead of uh, pumping data into their brains. Yeah, 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 perhaps. Uh, yeah, I don't know. How, how far in the future do you see that from actually happening? Because that's a complete transformation of the current system, which is really based uh, on the, the teacher as a conduit for pumping data into brains. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the he, – he's a, he's a bit – considered a bit left-wing, but Paulo Freire, who was a, um, a Brazilian educator writing in the 60s, he used to talk about – uh, what we have at the moment in education is this banking model where the teacher is the banker and he deposits coins in the heads of students. And instead, he encouraged the development of a, a problem-posing pedagogy. Um, you know, and I think, yeah, that, that, that's, that's... His ideas are certainly, I think, gaining currency in the, in the current climate. I mean, PBL, project-based learning, it's got its detractors and its supporters. Um, but I think certainly... It's got more relevance to the world of work than, you know, uh, uh, an assessment or an essay. You know, I don't remember the last time I had to write an essay for work. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the out of interest? What are the detractors saying about PBL? 
Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but why? Like, what's their well, what's their argument? Because I've only ever heard good things about did, it. Do they have something oh, better? Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Spend some time on on UK Twitter or, or Aussie Twitter. <laughs> okay. If you're not already. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I'm certainly not an expert by any stroke of the imagination, and I've I've worked in both. Um, but generally, the argument goes along the lines that um, PBL does not allow students um, the chance to process the information. There, there, there is too much going on, um, and it, it's I think the technical term is, is cognitive overload, whereas if there was a period of, um, I don't want to say direct instruction, let's call it explicit instruction, um, it would allow students to develop uh, a base level of understanding. And then once students have a base level of understanding that is they've graduated from school uh they're more ca- they're more capable of engaging in project-based learning you know th- it's, it's based on this idea that um the people with with a lot of knowledge about a topic learn new knowledge about it in very different ways than um people with very little knowledge about the topic and, and that's to do with you know the 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 schemas that are already in place in in um, academic learning for, for people who are advanced. I'm not sure it's true, and, and I think it's a simplified view of PBL. I certainly think, um, you know, I, I like the idea of a, a really blended learning model where where it's a whole range of different activities, and most teachers I know do that anyway. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a rejection of PBL. It, it sounds more like the arguing that it's got to be managed in a certain way to, you know, to maximise the outcomes instead of just a flat-out rejection. But I, I was also wondering, you know, the, the big thing in town today in education, or one of the big things, is uh, maker education, also sometimes called maker revolution. What lessons can we take from maker-style education that perhaps we can apply at schools, uh, even in the, without, you know, fundamental changes in the way the schools operate, like, a teacher tomorrow, can they learn something from maker education and just take that learning to classroom and apply it? I, I was a high school teacher for about 15 years. And I, with that combined with my um, earlier experiences as a student, I, I can just, I've been in education just long enough. You know the, the saying that, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, and you, you, you know, um, with MIT and, and Scratch and everything like that, this idea that children need to learn to program, which is kind of a little part of the whole Baker revolution. Um, I can remember in the, the 1980s where I think it was Logo. Uh, everyone had to learn Logo. And then it just died out. Yeah, yeah the turtle. Uh, and then it came back, you know. Um, and and uh, it's it's not just... Uh, technological education or whatever you want to call this this particular category you know we see the same thing in approaches to to um to literacy learning or, or mathematics learning i think you know i mean it, it needs to be a break away from a, an evolution uh, to towards more a revolution something that has to be i mean yeah, something that is completely different um, and, and it looks different to what school looks like now. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the big idea that we talked about beforehand with this kind of personalised industrial scale education um, would look different because you could access it anywhere. You know, I think the potential of, of virtual reality as well. You know, why does school have to happen at school? And, and there are, you know, there are reasons to do with economy and childcare and employment that and, and accountability, I guess, um, that may dictate it, that it has to be that way. But, you know, five years ago we were saying, well, you know, we have a taxi industry because of this, this and this, and it didn't take very long for the taxi industry to, to kind of fall apart, well, whatever you think of that, and, you know, I, I've got my own concerns about that. But the, this idea of the disruption yeah. I mean, I don't remember the last time I bought a book that actually had paper in it, you know. <laughs> so what do you think the biggest thing uh, is that will disrupt education in Australia? Could be a technology or some policy perhaps or some other social pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I don't think I don't think competition. I, all of those things will disrupt education, but I think I think people are very conservative when it comes to education. I tell you what, what will uh, and and we're already we've we've been doing it for years. Um, you know, places like the the school of the air, that kind of thing. When that kind of technology becomes accessible, um, in in a in a a way that everyone can access it, and it becomes um, uh, accredited, so that it actually means something as well. I think that could be be really really huge. I mean, we're already seeing uh, growth in in homeschooling. Um, you know, growth in in online university courses and, and places like um, Stanford and, and MIT offering those um, those free courses where you only pay for the certification at the end. You know, that's if if I was a university, well, you know, I work at a university, but I, I don't make those kind of decisions. I'd be really nervous about that. Uh, so you mentioned something about School of the Air. Did I get that right? Could you tell us what that is? Oh, okay. Um, that, that, that's the the radio school that provides education to students in in really remote locations. Um, so so it's all taught over over radio waves, and that's it's been like a podcast. For years. Like a podcast. Well, radio not radio. so much radio waves. <laughs> I don't know if it's radio waves anymore, but they're suddenly moving more to the web as well. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. So that's uh, understand that that has been going on for decades, perhaps. It's yeah. not a new thing, is it? No, no. So the school school of the future is the one that yeah. I've dealt with in the past, and yeah, like you, they are quite heavy on the Raspberry Pi and Arduino mm-hmm. side of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Really, yeah. Uh, okay, so we're we're running out of time, unfortunately. So we're going to move to part three of today's podcast, which is the rapid fire questions section. Pete, do you want to explain what? <laughs> So this is. We'll, we'll try to keep our questions uh, short and concentrated. You can take as much time as you like to answer them. But we, we'd like these, uh, we wrote this question so that they are practical in nature and our listeners can take something right away out of them and, and use it the next day. So, for example, uh, tell us about an application, either on your computer or your tablet or your mobile phone relating to education or you work as a teacher that you can't live without. Um, ooh. Oh, Evernote. Evernote. And that, that's across everything. I love Evernote with a passion. <laughs> um, oh, uh, I have, um, I use Zapier, which is kind of this um, management tool that, that puts flows in place, or they call them zaps, I think. Um, so basically, any notes that I write, it, it sends to Evernote for me and files them in the right place. And if it's got dates or things in it, it puts it in my calendar. Or if I, I you know, put a to-do next to it, it puts it in my Wonderlist app and, and, and categorizes it for me so that, you know, I know that if I've written it down somewhere, it's going to remind me in two weeks that I've got to follow up on something like that. It will haunt you. So Evernote's your note-taking app and Zapier, or Zapier yeah. is sort of like the glue that connects that to other different apps. Yeah. Like calendars and wonder list and, and, and wonder list, list is just like a really simple to do list um but but yeah, i like it and it's easy to use so really you can't forget anything now no excuses <laughs> no excuses yeah. <laughs> Automation. Oh, right, it's kind of got to follow it up <laughs> oh, awesome so who has been the most inf- influential in shaping the way that you teach uh-huh. <laughs> um uh, it I could be a fictional that. person or a real person no, I used to work with a principal um, who was he, – he wouldn't admit it, but it was patently obvious that he was terrified to try anything new. It, and they were enthusiastic and they were willing and we wanted to, to really do some exciting things. Uh, and and it, wasn't, it wasn't caution so much as fear that, you know, I don't want to try anything new. And and you know, eventually you have to leave those places because you know what's that saying? If you if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And what we were, were getting wasn't all that good. It could have been better. You know, the moment as an educator, you, you just relax and 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 stop doing the next thing. I think I think you stop learning, and that's that's not good. More so, teaching you not what to do. 
or yeah. what not to do rather <laughs> okay. yeah. lead by example right yeah. with, your, with your students so for new educators just starting out getting prepared for teaching stem what what advice would you give to them um oh join your union <laughs> <laughs> um really absolutely yeah union fees are tax- even in <laughs> that's a that's a unique advice we've received so far can yeah. you elaborate on that please for Oh, sure. In 2017, um, I, I didn't think unions were still a... Uh, oh, an education. Going yeah, in yeah. In All education. right, okay. I mean... Yeah, tell us. Please tell us about this. Okay, Re- really quickly. Um, and, and I'm talking mostly New South Wales here, the, the Teachers' Federation for Public and the Independent Education Union for, for non-government schools. Um, if, if you want a voice in your profession, um, you absolutely have to join your union because they're the ones who are going to you know, do something about the fact that 50% of teachers leave teaching within the first five years. And that's because of the workload, you know. I mean, teaching is a, is a vocation and it's something that you should love. Um, you know, Paulo Freire, who we talked about earlier, he said it's, it's an act of love, teaching. Um, but even that shouldn't affect your, your health. It shouldn't affect your, your family life, your relationships. Um, you know, there's no good reason that anybody should be working 65 hours a week, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, t- unions also do a lot of stuff on um, your accreditation and your, you know, your professional development hours that you need to maintain, and they're generally free for members. And, of course, the scary thing is, and, and it's happening more and more often, when, when you get assaulted at work, which unfortunately happens to teachers more regularly, or a child makes an allegation against you, it's nice to know that there's someone else who's going to pay the lawyer's fees. Oh, that's, that's important. Did not yeah. know that. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so how should new educators get prepared for teaching? Uh, STEM, spe- specifically STEM. STEM. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I've got a really simple um, methodology and, and most teachers do the first step, but they don't necessarily follow up on it. So the first step is, you know, if, if things aren't working well, Try something new uh, and then evaluate it. So, you know, don't just try it for the sake of trying it and then not think about whether it worked. And then rinse it out and repeat. Keep trying something new because, you know, the, the, the line about education, you know, this is um, – how does it go? It's, it's, it's really quite clear. You know, this is education. Everything works somewhere but nothing works everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think – Educators, as professionals, as relationship people, need to have the skills to modify their practice and then reflect upon whether it succeeded or not um, and then, you know, develop their practice that way. So you can't copy-paste something that somebody else does in your career and hope that it will work as a teacher. Yeah, okay, you've got to evaluate, (laughs) got to think about what you're doing and evaluate and improve, yeah. And uh, do you have a favorite programming language, Keith? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, in the old days, I remember MATLAB quite fondly. I liked MATLAB. <laughs> MATLAB. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I did that uh, in undergraduate. These days, it's, it's um, Python or, or Swift. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I did a lot of app development. Swift, Swift's the one. Oh, Raspberry Pi. Have you been playing around with Swift playgrounds? Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, along with Treehouse, Swift Playgrounds would probably mm-hmm. be, oh, and Scratch would probably be my go-to tools. You know, yeah, yeah. I think they're are those are those well, languages that you teach, especially Swift, because it's a newer language. Sorry, say that again. Is Swift a language that you teach yourself? Oh, I, I haven't. Students? I haven't taught it. Um, no, no, I taught Python for a while, um, which was yep. good. And, and then I spent a lot of time with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, um, mm-hmm. you know, because they're, they're such simple gateway languages, I call them, you know, easy to get into, mm-hmm. quite deep. Yeah, anybody can, can get into, right? And uh, that's why they're so popular in educational settings. So yeah. why would you teach Python over Swift or Swift over Python? Um, I'm geeking uh, out here. Yeah, no, no, totally. Uh, mostly the reason that you go for Python is simply because it, it fits – more nicely with with tools like Raspberry Pi, which you, what you've got access to. Um, whereas if you want to go with Swift, you know you, you probably need everyone to have downloaded Xcode uh, and needs a Mac to run it on, and then you need a device to test it on if you go that path. I mean, 
the other thing, I mean, Swift Swift has got all kinds of cool things, you know, with, with regards to the optionals and, and um, closures and all of that kind of stuff. But I reckon that's kind of, you know, year 11 and 12 stuff and certainly, you know, university level. When, when kids are learning the basics of, of programming and, and, you know, they're both object-oriented programming languages, so that's really important because, you know, that's the, the paradigm at the moment. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tempted with Ruby on Rails as well because you can do so much with Ruby. Um, yeah, sorry, you know, we're just getting carried away. But but Ruby, the fact that you can teach kids to build their own blogs and, and they can have it running on their own device in front of them in the space of two hours thanks to, to Rails, you know, it's just incredible. Um, Ruby truly is God's gift to programmers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love Ruby. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Not biased at all. Uh, I'm not biased at all. But I actually love Swift because they pulled a whole heap of stuff from Ruby, which is really nice. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> getting back on track. Uh, so obviously you must have been up on on Objective C. I mean, I, I played around in Objective C when when um, you know they started releasing the the, the program with Xcode and all of that, and that was that was hard, pretty hardcore stuff. And Swift is, is like sweetness and light <laughs> compared to that. Yes. Uh, and this, uh, but I've got to admit that when I was using Objective C, I actually felt like an engineer. Like how you felt cool. like an engineer. Yes. <laughs> this is it. It's tough. It's bloody, sweaty, but it makes me feel like a real engineer. Yeah. Uh, what I really like about Swift, <laughs> continuing to geek out here and being cognizant of the time, is that it reveals itself to you slowly so yeah. you can – you can get into it and it's you can start really light and treat it almost like an interpreted language, very similar to Python, and then you can go deep and you know Here's build things. system tools yeah. with it. So yeah, yeah I yeah. quite like it. It keeps you busy for years and years. Yeah. So learning. Yeah, I think it's a Never lot of depth. Quite master it, do you? Like there's always new things coming out as well. The language proves. Yes. Um, great. Okay, enough about programs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, professional development. Yeah. Any any uh, suggestions for our listeners about perhaps conferences around Australia that uh, are yearly that you believe that they should attend or, or other things as well? Yeah, like you're allowed to say uh, ones that you liked and ones that you didn't like that you think are probably a waste of time for people and they should avoid. Yeah. Um, all right. Twitter, I mean, edu Twitter is a fantastic professional development tool as long as you go into it with your eyes wide open. There's a there's a educational chat called Aussie Ed, which takes place every Sunday, 8.30. Um, and I know a couple of the people who, who are often running that. Um, that's what that's worth looking at. Uh, the the TER podcast is run by a couple of teachers. Um, that's always worth listening to. I spend a lot of time in the car these days, so that's it's good to have a podcast. Uh, I mentioned Treehouse. I think Treehouse is... Is sensational. A lot of universities offer um, access to Linda. Um, that's worth at as well if you if you're at university or maybe your institution does it. Um, so what what is Linda and what's this treehouse for oh, people? But yeah, sorry, Linda is a whole collection of uh, it's it's actually a huge range of courses, kind of heavily leading towards technology, but it, it's pretty much everything from photography to graphic design to programming. Um, you know, and everything in user experience, everything in between. Uh, and there's, there's, um, you watch a video, uh, and then you complete a course, you know, and then you move on to, oh, complete an activity, and then you move on to the next video, and then you know, you, you develop your skills that way. Treehouse is very similar, but it's even more focused solely on um, technology side of things. Uh, yeah, but, but both of those are pay as you use them, well, but they're they're quite reasonable. But the best professional development um and and it's it's kind of heavily weighted towards uh one operating system over any other but um you know the apple distinguished educator program and they've just released in the last couple of days the apple teacher program um so this is an opportunity for anybody to enroll in the apple teacher program and to to go through it starts off um you know using your your devices uh, effectively, uh, but then it steps up into some more more challenging, um, and, you know, and for me more interesting side of things. You know, that's always worth worth having a look at as well. Yeah, 
Are they leaning more towards the Mac or towards iOS? Both, both. So there's, I think there's two streams. There's there's a Mac and an iOS stream, and you get badges. It's it's a bit gamified, which is which is nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank cool. you for this. This is very very useful. We'll put them up on the show notes as well, so cool. you can just click on them and, and reach those uh, very interesting places. So um, we've reached the end of this podcast episode, but we still have a few minutes. So, Keith, do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners, like uh, things like do this or don't do that or look out? Um, something I was thinking about um, in the car, funnily enough, hmm. <laughs> I, I STEM education is often um, mixed up with STEAM education, this idea of mm. bringing in the arts. And mm. I've recently started hearing STEAMED education. STEAMED, yes. Entrepreneurship and design. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, it's getting pretty good. <laughs> people always say, you know, oh, gee, isn't that just the curriculum? And, you know, really we need to focus just on science and technology and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I'm always putting in mind, and you know, history teacher, Winston Churchill, um, in World War Two. Uh, supposedly, the story goes, they they went up to him and said, "Listen, we need to cut funding to the arts because we need to put more money into the the, the war effort because otherwise Guns. we're going to lose." And supposedly, Winston Churchill replied, "Well, if we do that, what are we fighting for?" And so, you know, this I, I, leadership, eh? Yeah, yeah. I, I think don't. Don't silo yourself away as a, a STEM teacher or something like that, you know. We're, we're, we're teachers of children. We're teachers of young people. Um, and we teach them far more than, than the content in the curriculum and everything we do. Yeah. So the, I suppose the, the do is be inclusive, right? Uh, in education, nothing really should be excluded. And even though we are labeling a particular style of education as STEM or maker or whatever it might be, it, you still need to see it as all inclusive. Whatever your your passions, your curiosities, or your making takes you, um, it's fair enough. Let it take you wherever it takes you. And yeah, and these these things don't exist in silos. You know, hmm. <laughs> there's hmm. not a scientist out there who who isn't inspired by by art or influenced by art. You know, the and 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 um, you know, academics and and teachers and students borrow and should be encouraged to borrow liberally from, from you know, these, these artificial divisions across. You know, the, the person who, who in, you did a lot of study into to chaos mathematics wasn't a mathematician. He was a meteorologist. You know, so, yeah, <laughs> there's more books than there are divisions, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. I think that there was a very nice uh, fitting closing uh, parting thoughts. So, Keith, um if, uh, if, if people want to get in touch with you, perhaps um, read your work, uh, if you have a blog, if you have um, a, a magazine where you write frequently, um, if you want people to follow you on Twitter, um, Basically anything you want, to, anything plug. You want to, to plug, now is the time. How do people get in touch with you or learn about you? Yeah, um, I, I'm spread across all kinds of different things. I do have a, my own website. It's mrheggett.com. That's M R H E W G A R T dot com, but it's perennially being torn down and updated as I, I fiddle with it. Um, so probably the best way is just to follow me on Twitter at um, at Keith Heggett. Yeah, it's my Twitter handle. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We'll include a link. Yes, we'll post it. Make okay. it a little bit easier. Awesome. Thank you well, very Keith. much, Keith. It was an no, awesome conversation. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Keith. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.